Hello everybody, how's it going? Ben Gothard here with another Project Egg interview and today we are talking to Dewan Bainey from Canada. How are you doing today, Dewan? I'm doing amazing. Thank you so much for having me on your call, man. Absolutely. I appreciate your time as well and it is great to have you as a guest on the show. So let's jump right in. My sure. first question for you, Dewan, is what is your story? Yeah, so um, without going down the rabbit hole too far there, um, I grew up in a small town in Canada, a uh, single family household, really had to grind for us to kind of survive. So definitely no silver spoon there. Uh, started in the hospitality industry because that was pretty much the only place I could go uh, at the time and uh, worked my way up through there. Uh, graduated school with the intention of being an engineer. I went uh, first year into engineering and uh, 4.0 average and dropped out and uh, dropped out <laughs> three times actually. So I went from engineering to business uh, to kind of like a business hybrid, and I dropped out and uh, was really lost for quite some time. I, uh, I fell into the music industry, uh, throwing events, and uh, loved it to death, and um, really was trying to build a business within that space. And for those people that are in the music industry, it's, uh, it's a difficult one. Selling music is a, uh, is a very hard thing to do right now, and, uh, and the money's in events. So... Uh, to kind of fast forward, I did a bit of traveling. I was in Florida for a year, took a hospitality management degree there. Uh, at the time, the economy took a hike, which was in 2008. So I was 20 years old trying to uh, apply to jobs that 30-year-old people were, were applying to and uh, didn't work. Uh, moved back to Canada and then moved out west of Vancouver, and that was about six years or so ago. Um, started record label and, uh, same thing, realized that selling music was tough and, uh, moved into Amazon selling on, uh, on Kindle specifically, uh, had some pretty good success there, uh, about 150 bucks on the Amazon platform. And, uh, at my peak, I was making about 15,000 a month, uh, publishing and, uh, got approached by a business partner to, uh, to build a software company. And, um, so that's gone really well. That's been about the last two and a half years, uh, roughly about a thousand members there. And uh, now I'm running a full marketing agency, uh, helping entrepreneurs get their message out there, uh, specifically focusing on video SEO, because I think there's just an, on, an amazing opportunity to get your message out there. Um, because of my YouTube channel, I think I've been able to get a ton of success. And it wasn't like I was putting out a ton of videos, just well-placed videos. I've got about one point I think 1.2 million views and about 30,000 subscribers, or sorry, 30,000 views every month. And uh, I'm not really putting out a lot of videos. It's just about putting out quality videos that really serve people's messages. Sorry, ser serve, serve people, helping me put up my message out there, and then more importantly, kind of, you know, solving their problems. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. That is awesome, man. So yeah, um, I want to I want to dig into your past a little bit more. Yeah, right? absolutely. So you talked about how you grew up in a small town and you you really had to grind to survive. Can yeah. you t can you talk about what you really learned from that time period and and how that grind and that hustle has come back to to teach you lessons that have paid you dividends later on? Oh man. Um, yeah, and I think there's two ways you can play the game grinding, and and I mean I won't go super personal, but we, we really had no money. Um, you know, my mom was a very hardworking single mom, but none of us really had any education. Um, and you either kind of, you know, give up and, and just let life happen to you, or you can decide to, to figure it out. And, um, you know, this overnight success thing that people are looking for, it doesn't exist. You know, that, that overnight success that you see somebody, you know, popping up out of nowhere is because they've been grinding for 10 years prior. It might not even be in the same industry, but just building that work ethic. And, um, you know, just the idea of, of putting one brick at a time every day and, and, and not getting burnt out and realizing that as long as you've laid that one brick, then you don't have to relay that brick. But yeah, it was just really a difficult grind of like, treading water and sometimes one step forward, two steps back. And, um, but really just understanding that you're in control of your life and, uh, you know, things happen to you for sure, but it's how you interpret what's happened and then how you act on it. So, you know, if somebody's out there struggling right now, just put one step in front of the other and just do the best you can do. You may not have all the answers. And that's the other thing. I didn't know what was, what I was going to build. Like most of this business stuff happened by accident or, you know, somebody came into my life and then we, we started to work together. Um, but 
moving forward, not knowing what the plan is, is far more important than just sitting there and not moving, trying to wait for all green lights because they never exist. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, you talked about how you, the first industry that you really got into was the hospitality industry. Yeah. Big time. Can you talk a little bit about what you actually did? And again, some of those lessons learned, some of those takeaways from that. Yeah. So, um, originally hospitality in the restaurant industry, uh, literally just serving. And, um, the unfortunate element of that is that, you know, for those people that are in the industry, you're working every weekend, you're working nights when your friends are out having a good time, you're the person serving those people. But it definitely taught me this mentality of, of just almost like inviting people into your home. And I think it's translated to all of my businesses where, uh, people want to build relationship with the businesses that they're purchasing from. And having this sense of community or family or, or just service in your business goes so far now. I mean, you look at companies like Zappos where, I mean, their cornerstone pillar is that they, they're, they actually care, like they give a shit, right? Um, but I didn't spend a whole lot of time serving. It just wasn't for me. The uh, events side, uh, DJing and, and the music element, that's where I really got my first taste of real money and entrepreneurship to kind of uh, paint a picture. Imagine you book out a nightclub, let's say it's a 300 person nightclub and you charge $20 a ticket. Well, that's $6,000 from one night of work. Um, now of course there's carrying costs. You've got to book DJs, you've got to have talent. You, you, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure, but, um, I think anybody can say, yeah, to get 300 people into a room is not super difficult. Um, and I mean, you could do one, one event a, a month, and, and be okay, you know, make 40 or 50 grand a year take home. So, um, and there's, there's something about being able to serve a large audience all at once versus kind of a one-on-one -on -one that's exciting. And I think that's where I really got my taste of like, Hey, I want to be able to scale business at a larger level. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, you, you mentioned how being able to truly serve, uh, customers is, is kind of a cornerstone of, of yeah. business. Yeah. Can, could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit, specifically for people who they may be chasing money right now? Yeah. Like they may be on the grind and, and be thinking, all right, I need to make money and, and I've got to figure out the easiest way to make, you know, $10,000 a month or whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? So uh, the financial thing, I get it. I've been there where, you know, you're, you need $200 to pay rent or you need like you're just you're in this fight or flight mentality. The problem is, is that you, you're thinking very short term and that's why you're stuck in this grind state. So if there's somebody on this call right now, that's trying to figure out how to make an extra thousand dollars this month, let's say, I think this is maybe the best way I can explain it. Um, instead of asking, how can I make a thousand dollars? Ask the question, how can I generate two or $3,000 of value in the marketplace? So how can I help people of two or $3,000? And then give them a discount so that they only have to pay a thousand. That's almost the mindset. So, you know, in my business now, I'm thinking at a 10 X level. So if somebody's spending a thousand dollars with me, how can I give them $10,000 of value so that it becomes such a no brainer versus I, I think a lot of people chasing money, they're thinking about how can I sell a thousand dollars, but it's only going to cost me $300 to fulfill. I think that's a very backwards way of thinking of it. So Again, that person that's sitting there that's saying like, hey, how can I make a thousand bucks? I'm going to use mowing lawns as an example because it's just like anybody can get it. There's somebody out there right now that is in so much pain because of their, their lawn, whether it's an old, you know, an old person or maybe somebody, their back's been put out or, you know, just go knock on a door, see the, see the, you know, they got the overgrown lawn. And instead of thinking of like, how can I get a hundred dollars from them? Connect with that person one-on-one -on -one because that grass that's overgrown, there might be other problems in their house that that's just the symptom of the problem, right? That the overgrown grass might be something, but maybe, you know, maybe they're, they're, um, I don't know. I'm just, just, you know, their house is super dirty or, or they've got, you know, plumbing issues in their house by you actually going in and asking them not about the lawn, but asking about why their lawn is where it is and actually caring, you may land three or $4,000. And I found in my life by actually building the personal relationships and asking people like what's actually wrong, not necessarily why is your grass, can I go cut your grass for 50 bucks, but asking them why what's wrong. 
building that relationship allows you to then have that customer for life. They may be able to refer you. They might have ten thousand dollars worth of worth of stuff that needs to get done, but because you actually came in and asked them, like, "Hey, why is your grass not cut?" I, I don't know if that kind of explains it, but that's the mindset of like service versus just trying to convert somebody into a lead. Lifetime customer value is where you're really going to make your money, not that one-time purchase. That is incredible value, and and I just kind of <laughs> want to reemphasize for everybody listening just the power of that, right? Instead yeah. of trying to solve one very specific problem, like like cutting the grass, you're going to the customer and saying, like, what do you actually need? What, you know, where where is the main source of your problems coming from? Because that source, if you can help them at that source, that is so much more valuable than yeah, just yeah. taking care of that, that one little problem. Ah, D1, that was awesome, man. That was great. So, so, so let's talk a little bit about your um, college years, right? You said you went to school yeah. um, to be an engineer and then business and then some sort of hybrid. Uh, can you talk about your time there and, and maybe with some emphasis on why school wasn't really for you and yeah. what, what what kind of caused you to drop out? So um, there was never going to be anybody really paying for my education to begin with. And, um, so it wasn't like there was like, Hey, I'm going to go and spend somebody else's money. And that's not relevant, but I just wanted to put that out there that that was the situation I was in. Uh, I was very techie. I was into cars at the time. I had this dream that I was going to be like a race car engineer, you know, go work for Ferrari or Lamborghini. I'm, I'm a car guy. And, um, the support network around me of people like, counselors and friends and and everybody seemed to be doing these very professional type jobs and uh, I didn't have any role models at the time so I decided look I'm gonna follow my passion which I think is cars and literally everybody's like well why don't you go into engineering and uh, you know I was good at math and physics so I said sure let's do it some of the classes were fun 90% of the classes were not you know the more hands-on stuff the designing stuff I, I something where I could see something tangible that I was making. Um, but I kept running into this, this mindset thing of like, why are we learning such useless stuff that we're never going to use? And this was a very technical skill like engineering. Like I, I completely believe that an engineer should get a degree or like an architect or a doctor things where you need to know and like people's lives depend on it. But so I went in, I got great grades, but I just couldn't stay engaged. And as I was looking down this career path, people are telling me I should go work for Manitoba Hydro, like the hydro company and get a really safe, you know, 80 to hundred grand a year job. And I felt like I could see the next 20 or 30 years of my life being exactly the same. And it just, I just got sick to my stomach. But the problem is, is I had nobody to turn to. There was no, entre again, no, no role models. There was no entrepreneurs. There was no, no people for me to grasp onto. And again, this was, I graduated in 2005. So it wasn't like even YouTube was really a big thing. And uh, so I dropped out and everybody around me was freaking out. And they're like, what are you doing? You're throwing your life away, basically, right, was, was what I heard. So um, I went back into business realizing that if I wanted to take control of my life, I would need to take control of my income. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go to business school, learn about business, and, uh, and then launch a business after. And I I just so clearly remember being in an economics class and I think they were talking about supply and demand and curves and this and that. And I kind of just sat back and I was closing my eyes. I'm like, who is this guy teaching me? This, this prof has never run a business. They're, they're just teaching textbook stuff. And unless I want to become an accountant or like an actuary, like what am I doing here? And I dropped out again. And at this point, you know, friends that thought I was smart and, you know, I had friends going into law and becoming doctors and becoming, and they were looking at me like I was throwing my life away. And that's why I ended up moving. I went kind of into a downward, not depression, but spiral. Like I just didn't know what I wanted. And that's why I had to leave. But by the time I came back the third time and the hybrid was kind of like a business development with, with like, like almost like project management and tech, I realized very quickly that, uh, if I was going to learn it, the school of hard knocks and just finding other people that had actually lived the life that I wanted to live and just somehow connect with them. Uh, at the time I did not have any connections, but I just decided to move to Vancouver. I figured that Vancouver is a little bit more of a hustle and bustle and that I could probably get involved in it. But, um, 
I think the biggest takeaway was that I just wish I had somebody, or at least I had looked for somebody who had or was already living my ideal life and just modeled what they did because there was nobody around me to, to even taste that entrepreneurship bug. And if somebody was there, I think I would have leapfrogged it immediately. But I was honest with myself. It wasn't that I couldn't do the school. I just, I didn't see myself doing it. So I was honest and I just made a decision and moved on. Absolutely, absolutely. So you, know, you kind of touched on the power of having a mentor a, a, a little bit. Can you talk about, you know, if you were to go back, how, what advice would you give to yourself about how to find a mentor, right? Like how would, technically, yeah. like how would you actually go about finding a mentor? Okay, so this is, um, this is a twofold question because I don't think I was even ready for a mentor at the time because I wasn't clear on what I wanted. And, um, you know, I, just before the call, I was, I was mentioning that I've, I've taken on a, a very, uh, you know, well-known mentor, um, who's been really pushing me, but I'm firmly believing that, that the, you know, the teacher will come when the student's ready, you know, to kind of go to that, that age old saying, because I wasn't clear on what I wanted and I was, I didn't take a direction. Like I, I kept hitting the school thing, but because I didn't take a direction of like, oh, I'm going to go start an XYZ business. Who can help me? That's why nobody came into my life because I just wasn't clear on what I wanted. You know, I don't really believe in the law of attraction per se, but there is something about like manifesting what you want when you claim what you want. So, you know, now I've asked myself, hey, I need a mentor who was in the internet marketing space, who's making seven figures plus, who's turned other people to seven figures plus, who also has great public speaking skills and like very, very specific and boom, the person appears. So if I was to go back to myself, you know, when I was in the 18, 19, uh, that's great that you accepted that you didn't want to go to school, but choose just something. And it's not a matter of knowing what you want to do long term, but choose something, start experimenting with an idea and then just ask for help. It never even occurred to me to ask for help. And, you know, part of my upbringing, I didn't really have anybody to look out for. So it never even occurred to me to go and ask somebody. Uh, it wasn't until, you know, four or five years ago where I started taking courses and realizing that there was education outside of the traditional, uh, you know, the traditional space. Um, I had done drop shipping, I had done affiliate sites, I had done a lot of SEO stuff, kind of internet marketing, you know, three or four years during that time. But it wasn't until about five years ago where I actually took my first course and like, I got it. So um, for somebody looking for a mentor right now, maybe take a course first. It's a small financial investment, maybe 30 or up to a hundred dollars. See if you like their training style, make sure that they're getting the result that you want, not just teaching you the context, but actually living the result. That's the difference. And, um, I do actually want to touch on that in a second, but make sure they're living the life that you want. Make sure that they're actually doing the thing that they're teaching and that you connect with them, take their course, execute on it. And when you're ready, th that mentor will be excited to work with you because you've taken that action. It, th the problem is now is so many people are just reaching out to mentors with no action plan and, and people are really busy. It's not that they don't want to help, but they don't want to help people that don't take action for themselves. I agree. I agree. And, yeah. and so can you talk a little bit more and you touched on a little bit about how uh, it's important to find a mentor who's actually living it instead yeah. of just, just, you know, talking about it. So this is going to come off very, uh, blunt, but I, I kind of don't give a shit because <laughs> people need to hear this. Um, there is a lot of bullshit in the internet marketing space where, you know, people are selling the dream and, you know, they're making money online, teaching people how to make money online so that person can teach somebody else how to make money online. And look, it's not my place to, to poke at people, but really look at not, not even the successes of the mentor, but look at their failures and have they overcome it. So, um, the current mentor that I'm working with right now, he has seen all the ups and downs. He's been here for, you know, 10 years in the industry, started off in internet marketing, just like me, had some massive failures. And it just seems like every time he gets knocked down, not only does he come back, but he comes back stronger. And it's just, there's so much proof in somebody getting knocked down and coming back up. And, um, a lot of the mentors out there are only doing it for the money. 
and they're positioning themselves as a coach or consultant, but they've never had any results. They've never made any money. They've never been public out there. Um, just because somebody has good information doesn't mean they should, they're a good mentor or that you should be following their lifestyle. And, and I also want to separate that. There are some fantastic internet marketers out there that have amazing information. They've taken information, maybe they've taken 10 courses and they've consolidated the best information to their own course. That's fine. But that information does not make them a good mentor. And that make sure you've got that kind of separation. And um, you're also seeing a lot of people doing this life coaching stuff too, but they've not gone through any experiences and it becomes this kind of perpetual wheel of life coaches, teaching life coaches, teaching. So I just want to put it out there. I've got no vested interest. I, like, I, I don't have a course. I don't, you know, but just truthfully look at the person and be honest to yourself. Are they selling? Is it the information that you like? If it's the information, great. But are they living it and actually executing on the information? That is the core thing. So if they're an expert at Facebook ads, I'm um, just using this as an example because I know Facebook ads is hot right now. Uh, so the information in their course, awesome, great. They're running ads to fill their course, great. See if they're running those ads in another industry. That's when you know they're real. You know, maybe they're helping somebody in the health and wellness industry. Maybe they're helping software as a service. See if they're doing it outside of the internet marketing space. See if they're doing it outside of the life coaching space or whatever other space they're in. That's a great test to see if it's somebody that you should follow. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's powerful. So, you know, I want to I want to move on to um, the to the time when you were into the music industry. Sure. Um, and you said you were, you had kind of gotten to this point where you were lost. It was kind of a downward spiral. Yeah. And, and then you got into the music industry. And so maybe can you give some insight on um, that transition from that period of, of being a little bit lost into that, that music space? Yeah. And I, I also want to mention that that lost factor. I don't think anybody is ever 100% clear. And I think that's a... Um, it's like a false expectation, even day to day. Like as I go through my business, I'm only doing the best that I can. I'm making, just making decisions and acting on those decisions, whether they're right or wrong is not really relevant. And I think that was the shift. It wasn't like I found anything. It's just that I decided to, okay, this is what I know. And this is what I think is right. And I'm just going to take action. And by taking action, lost didn't necessarily mean that I got found or that I figured it out. It's just, I went from lost to getting momentum. And that's, that's maybe a nice mindset shift that going from lost to momentum. So, uh, I went to a couple festivals and I really got excited about just the raw energy and, you know, whether you're white, black, green, red, male, female, whatever, it's just, everybody is kind of there in the moment sharing. And there's something very powerful about that. Um, you know, where people are transported for the two or four hours, wherever they're there, where their problems are kind of left behind. And there was just something magical about that, not only uh, creating that experience, but being in that experience. And um, so, yeah, I doubled down into the music industry, realized that the money was an event. So I was doing events for quite some time. But um, like I said, it's just the people that I was surrounded with were not necessarily inspiring me. It's not that they were bad people. It's just they weren't inspiring me in their lifestyle. And I didn't see myself, you know, for the next 15 years being out every Friday night at, at nightclubs or events. It just, it wasn't really what I wanted. So um, I moved to the record label model with the mindset of let me help artists who are about the music, not necessarily about the party, but about the music, get their message out there and then build them a platform. But again, the challenge is, is even selling music, it's, it's very difficult. And I think the big shift really for me was understanding that like music's art and it's subjective. And I had a friend show me the publishing model where it's identically the same. You're still selling digital products, but instead of something subjective, you can sell something objective where if you can sol solve a problem through some sort of digital product, you'll get paid. And I was seeing these problems in the marketplace where I knew people were getting paid for it, so why not just create a product there? And it was just, it was a light bulb moment of, I can serve people knowing that they'll purchase it, rather than create this music or create this art and um, not know if I'm gonna get a monetary gain from it. And it's not that I needed the money, but you need money to survive. And, and without money, the, the passion can't kind of come through. So um, I still have the label, I still do events, 
but it's not the main source of income because I, I want the art to stand on itself. And um, in a lot of ways, I'm kind of funneling the business stuff back through now as I relaunch it again. So very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned at one point that anybody can get 300 people into a room, you know, if they, if they really wanted to. Can yeah. You, can you maybe talk about, because I think that it's important to be able to gather people and, and build communities and, and kind of build an audience. So can you maybe talk about some actionable things that people can do in order to build that community and build that audience, whether it be in the form of getting people to show up to a, a live event or whether it be, you know, a group on Facebook, you know, uh, either. Yeah. Or- yeah. So that's an interesting comment. So, um, I'm all in on YouTube right now. I think we're at the stage now where transparency and authenticity uh, is really selling. And back to that mindset of uh, creating friends, right? Like creating a relationship, creating something long-term where where uh, people are not just a number. And I kind of just said, oh, 300 people in a room. But truly, those were maybe 50 relationships that I've built And those 50 relationships may be told another five people, and then it created this ripple effect. Um, There is an article, um, I'll send it to you after the call, just so that we can maybe put it in the show notes, but it's uh, A Thousand True Fans. And it was an article that I read quite some time ago. And um, it really spoke to me. It's about the music industry, but it's applicable to kind of any industry. And the idea is, it's not about creating 10,000 fans or 100,000 fans or, or a million fans. Your goal is to create a thousand true fans who are emotionally invested in your story, your journey, and then ultimately your art. You see, I didn't say art first though. They're invested in your story. It's about the storytelling. It's about, you know, sharing openly how you're creating that art up until that point. And then because they're so excited, they're, they're happy to spend the $50 or hundred dollars. So imagine as an artist, I want to give you context here. Uh, you sell a track on iTunes for $2.99. Okay. Uh, iTunes will approximately take 50%, so you're left with $1.50. Well, if you split that with a record label, let's say 50% again, you're left with 75 cents a track. Selling a thousand, a thousand songs in my side, like the electronic music world, is, is a lot. So that's $7,500 if you break through, if, 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 right? Like just a lot of ifs. There's no way you can survive on that. But imagine if all you did was collected relationships where you know, you, you, you meet with a promoter, or you meet with a friend and you give them, I don't know, you give them a USB stick with, with your, your songs, right? Like really kind of one-on-one. Well, that giving that USB stick, yes, we had to do that in person, but imagine if you could do that digitally, that's the power of being online now. So, uh, instead of it being a USB stick, maybe it's a zip file that they can then download and they get access to your whole collection or maybe access to, the samples or the vocal, I don't know, something, right? I'm just making an idea here. But if you can figure out something that's valuable enough to give to somebody where they'd be willing to give your email in person, right? Don't think very broad, just in person. And then think about a way to follow up with that person and and build relationship, whether it's sending them a personal text message of you in the studio or, you know, an Instagram DM about whatever's going on. But this mindset of like, okay, one-on-one, and then all you have to do is figure out the technology to scale it. So that becomes a landing page on your YouTube video saying, hey, get my free samples. Uh, just enter your name and email and I'll keep you up to date if something comes up. If you can do it one-on-one, you can do it with 10. You can do it with 100. You can do it with 1,000. If you can get 1,000 people in your network that truly love you, your art, and what you do, to ask for $100 from somebody once a year or maybe $25 a quarter whether that's, hey, jump on a call with me, getting back to the business world, getting back onto a call with me, or hey, I'm doing a live event. Um, Don't you think that's a very easy ask if you've been building relationships through the year? And I mean, I don't know about you, but I've spent $100 on some really stupid shit, like like stuff that I've never even thought of. Or, you know, when was the last time you went to the bar and spent 30 bucks without thinking about it? Most people, right? Most people. So, if you could capture that $30 twice a year from a customer because you've added so much value and you say, hey, here's my art, whether it's, hey, guys, I've been working on this checklist slash course on XYZ. Uh, you've been seeing me work on it. It's for 30 bucks. 
they'd be like, oh yeah, for sure, no problem. And then you ask again, well, if you have a thousand people on your email list, now I'm getting a little bit more tangible, a thousand people on your email list that truly love you, that's a 60 to 100K a year business. For most people, 20 or $30,000 online is a huge amount of money. But the way that I've kind of talked through this, you see how it becomes very easy. Um, but people are thinking, how do I get a thousand people on my email list and sell them a bunch of shit they don't need? Like, no, like just build relationship one on one and then scale it. That is awesome. That is some <laughs> serious value right there. So to everybody listening, you know, I would I would actually go back and re-listen to that part, maybe take some notes and implement that into your own business. Because yeah. I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's that one on one connection. You can truly build that relationship with one person. Your, you know, maybe it's your ideal customer. Maybe it's, yep. you know, who who your ideal customer becomes. But if you can build that one on one relationship, and you can ask them for a favor, and you can do favors back for them, and maybe flip that, do favors for them first, and then ask for it back. Yeah. Provide serious value. I mean that that is that is awesome, Dion. So thank you again for that. Yeah, so, no problem. Um, you know, I want to talk about how um, you you took some time to travel. Yeah. So can you talk about? I believe you said you went to to Florida. Um, yeah, I was in Boca Raton for a year, and uh, recently I went to kind of, yeah, anyways, yeah, I did a bit of traveling. So can you can you talk about um, some of your takeaways from travel and, and what you learned and, and why you went in the first place? Yeah, I think it came down to one thing, and it was just changing my perspective. And, you know, some people are really good at blocking out external influences. Uh, for me, I tend to take it in quite well or quite bad, depending on which way you want to look at it. Um, so just having a change of environment and seeing a completely different perspective and understanding that your view is only your view. It's only your lens. And, and you know, all of a sudden, if you take somebody else's glasses and put on, you, you see a completely different way. And I think that was my biggest takeaway. It was just understanding that there are other perspectives and you only know what you know. And uh, consistently challenging that uh, applies anywhere. Um, I know, you know, we've all heard the saying of you're, you're the average of the five people that you surround yourself with. It's big time. I also think that's the environment that you surround yourself with. So you've got control over that and you've got control over changing the lens. So experiment with the lens. Like if you're not excited about what's going on right now, whether it's financially, your business or whatever, you know, in general, uh, ask yourself what different lens there is and maybe surround yourself with somebody that's got that different lens. Or, you know, in my case, I didn't find my hometown very inspiring. The people around me had a very set life. And again, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just different ambitions. And I felt like I didn't belong. So I decided to change my, completely change my environment. Uh, Florida did not end up being the place that I wanted to live, but at least I tried, right? And in that trying and multiple trying, you get to know what you don't like too not necessarily just what you like, and then you're able to polarize it. So, you know, for me now, I know exactly what I don't like. I may not know the answer to everything I do like, but as I figure out what I like, well, then I try to attract that in my life, whether it's, you know, living in a beautiful place now. You know, for me, I know I want to be living near the mountains, um, near nature, where it's inspiring. Vancouver's a great place. Um, I want to be surrounded by high-level entrepreneurs. I want to be surrounded by places where there is money. Vancouver also applies to that. Um, but I also want to be in industries where I can see a difference. Like I, I mentioned before, the publishing was great, but I didn't have that personal connection. So I'm also surrounding myself with thought leaders or people that are working with projects that they're passionate about. So um, different lenses and different perspective, I think, is the two biggest things that I took away from traveling. That That is cool. That's awesome. And, and, you know, I definitely think that while it may be expensive for people to travel or difficult to travel... Uh, you know, I, I do think that it really opens up your eyes and, and gives you a much better perspective because, you know, you, you may not realize the effect of the people around you, yeah. that what that, that effect is on you until you get up and go. And then yeah. you just see all there is that actually is out there and the difference that it can make. So I think that's really powerful what you were saying. Yeah. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about when you came back to Canada um, yeah, and and I believe you said you went to Vancouver at that point. Yeah. Um, what did you do when you first got there, and um, how did you start really laying down your roots once you? Once yeah, you this was a good question. So, uh, when I left Winnipeg, uh, I left with my my girlfriend. Uh, we're still together. I think we've been together for about seven years now, or eight. I don't know. 
I don't think she'll count it on it. On me. Um, I had like a rusted out 97 Honda Civic, two garbage bags of clothes, one for me, one for her, and uh, a bunch of DJ equipment in the trunk. So like literally, we had no plan. We had no idea. Uh, we crashed at a person's house that we actually met at a festival. So just so like really no plan. Um, and I worked a lot of really terrible odd jobs. Like I was working as a printer rep for, I don't know, I can't remember the company now. Uh, I was doing car rental. So really, like I'm talking really crappy, crappy jobs. Um, but then I had a major break. And uh, at the time, I wanted to learn, really learn about business properly. Again, everything that I was doing, I kept failing. Again, drop shipping and some affiliate stuff. Because I didn't understand business. Like I understood value and I understood like money. But like a business is a machine, right? It, it, it It's... It's its own thing that is designed to generate money, and I just couldn't put it together. Uh, so I, I was on Craigslist one night putting an application through, and I, I came across uh, this job posting for a GPS tracking company. And um, I had some 12-volt experience. I used to be a car audio installer. And I applied there, and it was exactly what I needed. It was a small business. They had about 10 employees making... Uh, you know, low seven figures. So it wasn't like a big business. And, um, but more importantly, the entrepreneur there was very self-development driven, very core value driven. And, uh, and more importantly, it was, look, if you don't know the answer, you could learn. And that was like his mindset. And, uh, so I started off as support manager there and I worked my way up to operations manager in a year and a half. And, uh, it was only because, you know, partially because I'm entrepreneurial and uh, for people that are in a job right now where you've got a bit of control, uh, just quickly put the entrepreneur hat on and act like an entrepreneur in your role. And you'll be amazed at the, the stuff that just comes your way because I came in and literally my job initially was to answer support emails and respond to support emails. That was it. But I kept seeing all these inefficiencies and I would just fix them and then tell, you know, basically tell my boss. And he started to give me more and more slack, like, you know, and a little bit more flexibility. And before I knew it, he said, look, do you want to take over operations of the entire business? And I was like 23 at the time. And, um, you know, there was a lot of failures, but that was really the first spot where I was able to taste entrepreneurship for real without having my, my money on the line. I was seeing big numbers, right? This is a couple million dollar business and I'm able to make changes and save 20,000, 30,000, make a hundred thousand. And it built so much confidence that if I can do it for somebody else, why can't I do it for myself? So here's the key thing. It was in a job that I actually gained a lot of my skills. So, um, without that, I don't think I'd be where I am now. And so I spent about two and a half years with him and that's where I got heavily into learning books and understanding that there were mentors out there that didn't have to be face to face. Um, at the time, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk put out the book, uh, crush it. And I think that was one of the single books that really finally solidified, like, look, I have to do this. Uh, two and a half years later, three years later, working with him, uh, we split ways in a, in a very positive way. So I actually hired my replacement, make sure they were all trained up. And then I went on my own and that was about yeah, five years ago. Wow. That is cool. And yeah. then, you know, that just kind of goes to show the power of entrepreneurship even within the business. Big right? time. Because like you were saying, you know, you can you can work your way up and build your way up and, and learn the things that you need to do to go out on your own and still be living the entrepreneur's dream, the entrepreneur's lifestyle of being in control of your own destiny. So so I really do I really do like that what you said about you don't have to necessarily start your own business at first to be yeah. an entrepreneur. So I think that's and, powerful. And if you're in an industry, like, you know, I, I didn't actually know the industry I wanted to be in. I didn't realize I would end up in marketing. But um, if you're if you're in health and wellness and you want to own your or own your own gym, go work in the top gym in the city for a year. Because you're just going to, they're already, they're already doing the thing you want to do. What better skill is there? Like, if, if in, you know, three years from now, I decide I want to open up a bakery. Guess what I'm going to go do for a couple months? I'm going to go work in a bakery. I've got no ego. No, Why not learn what's already working and then optimize it instead of reinventing the wheel? So, um, yeah, that's just the other comment. 
don't be afraid to go work in somebody's business because you're going to learn so much. And the business is running, therefore there's something you can learn from it. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I agree with you completely. Don't reinvent the wheel. So, yeah. you know, let's, let's talk about when you uh, started your record label because yeah. I think that's one a really cool type of business to start. Sure. Um, and maybe you could give a little bit of insight on the steps that you took to actually get it started, right? And and was it was it right after you left that you started? Maybe give a little chronology. No, so so I was doing events prior, and it was just under my own like my own name slash label. It wasn't even a real like it was a sole proprietorship, right? I didn't even have a registered name, and uh, it's almost embarrassing to look back at how little I knew. And but I just kind of did what I did, right? So um, I I registered a name uh, like a, a URL. Uh, I, I ran it as a sole proprietorship, which I think was about a hundred bucks. I'm in Canada. It might be different for you guys. Uh, we don't have the, like, I guess you guys have like the LLCs or S corps or whatever. You, it's actually easier in us to register a corp than it is, uh, here. And, um, I just went to town. I went to every event I possibly could. I started, I mean, I realized that's two things. You need talent, which are DJs and you need people, right. To fill, to fill the room. And the intention was always to make the money off the events, but I, uh, I really struggled for a year and a half because I had this delusion, like I was going to collect all of these people and, uh, and make all this money. But of course, coming with the territory of making a business, there's competitors and competitors don't necessarily want you to win. Um, so I, I had to start collaborating and I had to swallow my pride a bit and start working with other existing promotion companies. And uh, in a lot of ways, it was not what I wanted uh, because I ended up just building their business for them. And I felt like just a, you know, like a promoter, basically. And, uh, you know, my comment of working in the business to learn the business, I actually chose not to in that case where I just I felt like it was a broken system. And I felt like I was being led down the, the angle that I didn't want to be led down. Um, so I had to really reevaluate why I even wanted to do what I was doing. And, um, even now as I'm kind of moving forward with my personal brand, I, um, I want to be the artist. And, uh, I realized that the label was just an extension of me being afraid to put myself out there. Um, but, and again, this is the thing, everything's kind of a learning process, but, uh, I was able to make connections and the label gave, um, not even social proof, but it just proved that I was serious about actually being in this industry. And it was that one next step over kind of the bedroom musician that was kind of just playing on the weekends. Uh, really what that label enabled me to do was get connections and, and open up collaborations that would not have been possible uh, if I didn't put myself out there. Very similar to YouTube. I mean, I think you probably found me on YouTube, right? That's how we set up this, this call. Uh, you had mentioned that you had interviewed a couple other of my friends. YouTube enabled me in the business world by me just putting it out there, uh, very similar to the label, and just putting yourself out there and creating content enables these collaborations now. And I think that was the biggest takeaway for me that, uh, yes, it wasn't a booming success and I had to pivot into, you know, the, the more entrepreneur side and the business owner side, but um, putting yourself out there and claiming something will allow you to level up your, really level up everything and looking for those collaborations in the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, from the from the time that um, you you did your, you were doing your record label and yeah. and all the event promoting and all and, and all that, um, when did you start doing Kindle? And and maybe you could give some insight on on that. Yeah. Life. So um, I already touched on the fact that music is subjective, right? It's not like anybody's necessarily searching for your music unless you have an audience. And I learned that very quickly that. Uh, without an email list and without an audience that you can reach out and touch every time you put out some music you're screwed anyways and your music is not even relevant and that's just the truth um so i had a friend uh god i can't even remember exactly how the conversation went but uh, i was really struggling like i didn't even know where my money was going to come from and at this point i was like man do i have to go get another job or do i have to work for one of these promoters and uh somebody just made the comment about ebooks and I was very familiar with the internet marketing space because, again, I, I, you know, I was making money internet marketing, but I'd never found a business model that purely made sense. And there was just something. So I, so I went onto Amazon, and I can't remember what the book was, but I just saw like a very specific book title, 
and I looked at the price and it was two ninety nine. I'm like, wow, this is not really that big of a commitment for somebody to purchase. And if I could create a book that solves a problem, somebody will buy it. And there was just a shift that I can create something knowing that it's valuable rather than creating a piece of art not knowing if it's valuable. But the beauty is, is that I had struggled through digital creation through the label anyways. Everything from creation, creating, licensing, digital uploads, distribution, um, you know, communication with artists, royalty, everything was exactly applicable. All I had to do was change the product I was selling to, to nonfiction ebooks. And, um, so I took a course, kind of put my own spin on it at the time. This is again, about four years ago, the conversation was just a shotgun approach books. And, uh, my pain point in the, in the music industry of not building a list, I applied immediately to Kindle where I said, no, I'm going to build a real relationship with my audience, even though they're pen names, like really give a shit about my customer, figure out their core 20 or 30 problems and then create books to solve that problem. So if they're in the golfing niche, create a book on how to add 40 yards to your swing, and then create another book on how to stop your slice and then how to put. So very, very specific books that I knew would solve problems. And uh, as soon as I got a taste of success, I actually wrote my first book. Um, and it's not super great. I've actually left it up there exactly as I uploaded it as kind of proof. Uh, so it's called declutter your inbox. And it was, it's honestly not a really that good of a book. I'm being very transparent. Um, I spent the weekend writing it. I figured out a topic that I thought was somewhat relevant. I saw another person in the market with a similar book and I published it. And within 24 hours, I made my first sale and I was hooked. I said, wow, this is like, I, like I got it. And I, I doubled down. I started kind of collaborating with some people within the marketplace we all became very close friends and we, we formed a mastermind group of just like-minded people. And, uh, that's why I was able to scale so quickly at, at the peak I was doing approximately four books per week, um, which worked out to be about, I don't know, 16 to 20 books a month. And I published pretty much consistently right up to about 150 bucks. I'm managing those books now, but, um, the core thing was, again, it was just understanding the business model and then just committing to it. Like I didn't dabble outside of that for a good year, year and a bit. And then finding other people that were committed and all of us committing as a group to just figuring it out. And uh, many of those people now are like, they're all top, top YouTubers now. I mean, Carla Marie is a close friend. Jason's a close friend. Dave Koziel was in that group for a bit. Um, you know, Sean Stewart. Anyways, the list goes on. Like all pretty much everybody that's within that YouTube space, we've all collaborated at some point. So um, just interesting about the committing to something and, and taking a course. That was another big thing. I, I, I took a course and I committed to learning the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's fantastic. So, you know, after, after you were in the, the Kindle space, you mentioned, um, that you were in the Amazon space, um, uh, so, software, software space. Yeah. Oh, software. software space. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry about that. Software space. Because Kindle is Amazon. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you how you made that transition from yeah. being more of a publisher to to more uh, of a software type company? So, um, there's this mindset of selling shovels that I've talked about a few times now, and um, you know, I touched on it with kind of the the bullshit in the internet marketing industry where people realize that the money is made in teaching a lot of ways, but you can do both. You can literally make the money teaching and do the thing. And I think the people that are hyper successful are doing both. So I'm not discounting the courses thing, but, um, I made a very large realization that, um, a, I wasn't happy publishing those written books. So I was just true to myself because if I, if I was enjoying it, trust me, all I would have done is just kept doing it. And I know there's, there's friends that I have that have 600, 800 books and they're super happy doing that. So nothing wrong. It was just awareness. Um, but I was seeing people struggling with this business model and not being told the information they needed to hear to actually succeed. But I didn't want to create a course because I felt like the courses, there were good courses out there. Um, you know, they would get you 90% of the way and the people that were creating the courses were emotionally invested in it. So it was great. I'm like, I don't need to create another that. Um, but I saw an opportunity every time my book is created, somebody has to write the book. 
Somebody's got to maybe edit the book. Somebody's got to create uh, a cover. And then there's a whole other process of researching and managing it. And uh, as I built my business out, I, I found systems and strategies that were applicable to anybody. But the problem is, is I couldn't scale it. So getting back to cutting that, that lawn, people are trying to mow the lawn, but they had far more problems within the business. And um, I got interviewed uh, on another, another YouTuber's channel, and this programmer from Bosnia approached me with an idea of, hey, do you think you could take your, your knowledge and create a package that would help publishers? And I said, yeah. So it took a long time, and it's a, software is not an easy space, but I was basically able to you know, develop with him something that no matter what, it would save them time or money. And it allowed me to stay out of the p place of having to coach people and just be able to give value. So my question was, how could I give somebody $300 worth of value and only charge them 30. And as soon as I could do that with one person, and we beta tested for almost six months, like, you know, we asked people to pay $5 for lifetime, I think, when we started, just to get people in the door to get some feedback. So it wasn't like I just opened the doors. Uh, very, very MVP, like minimum viable product. Put something out, ask them how we can improve it, improve it. They liked it, they told a friend. So it became a very kind of organic growth. But ultimately, by me, adds answering the question, how can I get $300 of value for 30 a month? We were able to grow the business. Now, Amazon is a very challenging uh, platform to build a business on from a software point because they're always changing. You know, they've got billions of dollars and I don't know how many thousands of, of, uh, of engineers and we're just a couple of guys. But um, the mindset comes down to being able to see where money's flowing and then just adding value. So you know, the, the idea of selling shovels, the, the analogy was when, when there was a gold rush, all these prospectors were coming to mine for gold. Well, why not just be in the business of selling shovels to the prospectors and let them do that? And if you become the trusted shovel seller, regardless of the money, you know, when the gold rush is booming, yeah, you're not going to make as much money because you could have been picking gold. But when it comes down, you're still that trusted source. So yeah, you're not going to get these crazy like ups and downs, but it creates a very consistent cash flow and you're able to build the business. So somebody that's out there right now, you know, maybe they're doing FBA as an example. Why not get in the business of creating labels for people? It's very unsexy, but you know that there's hundreds of people looking for that type of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I believe you mentioned that you had about a thousand um, users of your of your software company. Yeah, um, I think total we probably serves I don't know twenty five hundred or three thousand. Wow. Um, and it's a it's a monthly reoccurring business, so it's been good um, because I've got a partner. I don't want to talk about the money aspect too much there, but really the business mindset behind recurring business or recurring revenue is something that I want a lot of people to start thinking about. Um, even with my agency now where I'm at, uh, I take people on a monthly retainer because that way you're able to spend more time with the person and create more value. I think, I think there's a bit of a misnomer right now about selling low ticket products, especially in the internet marketing space where, Hey, it's about selling a $30 product. Quite honestly, you don't even want that $30 product customer because a lot of times they're, I'm going to being very transparent here. They're really cheap. They're going to buy your product. And then because they didn't commit into buying something long term, some other shiny objects going to appear and they're going to go buy something else. And then they realize, then they're sitting there asking themselves why they haven't got the result. Um, if you can create a business where there's a bit of reoccurring, but more importantly, you're committing to the success of somebody long term. So whether that's a six month program where it's like an implementation plan versus selling the one time thing, if people are not willing to buy in, don't worry about it. You're looking for committed individuals. Nothing can happen in a month. Nothing can happen in two months. But three months, six months, a year, now we're talking. Um, so build a vehicle where you can own that relationship long term with somebody. Um, you know, whether it's a monthly ghostwriting service, if they're in Kindle, you know, if it's Facebook ads, maybe you manage their Facebook, social media plus. Those are great businesses where you don't have to keep selling over and over and over. And that's the other thing. You know, my, my seven figure plan for my agency sounds like a lot of money, but, um, if you can get 20 people at $5,000 a month, 
it's a million dollar business. Now it might sound like out of reach for a lot of people, but if a business is making, let's say a million or $2 million a year, I'm not saying online, it's just a bricks and mortar. I think that's pretty, that's not like a crazy number, right? Like a bricks and mortar place doing $200,000 a month is not a lot. Uh, if they were to hire somebody out of school that has a decent education, would you not say 3,500 to four grand a month, like a 50 grand a year salary is probably reasonable. Um, now they've got to pay EI or, or in our case, pension plans in Canada. So by the time this employee or employer hires this employee, that $40,000, $50,000 a year employee might cost them 60 or 70,000. And they don't even know if they're going to get the result because they're fresh out of school. Or an agency like myself can come in. I know I can get them the result and they can write off that $5,000 a month. So it's not even going to cost them anything. They get a tax write off. Do you see how that becomes a very easy value proposition where don't worry about hiring an employee, write off the money and know that I, like, I'm really good at what I do. I only need 20 of those type of people to have a million dollar business. And I don't have to keep selling a million dollars every year. If I'm getting them the result, they'll stay with me for life. So Think of that mindset as you're building your business. How can I capture somebody for life or for a year at least? You don't have to keep selling. I sold low ticket products before and man, is it a stress? Like, you know, if you're selling a hundred dollar product to make $8,000 for the month, every month you need to sell 80, you know, you need to sell two or three every day. And at some point you might run out of customers in your niche or you've run out of stuff to talk about. So um, really think about, yeah, like what that monthly could be where you can give value long-term. That would be my biggest suggestion from kind of learning this whole software process. Absolutely. And, and you actually, you foresaw my question because that was exactly where I was going with that of, of how to really, you know, build up that, that, uh, yeah. subscriber base. That, that's awesome. So, um, you know, I want to talk about your, your marketing agency. Hey. Um, so can you, can you talk a little bit about what specifically y'all do? Um, and and kind of talk about how you started the business and, and really got some traction. Yeah, so um, I really needed to figure out how I could uh, create massive, like really massive impact. And I know it's a very cliche thing to say, but um, the prior businesses that I was in, I just wasn't getting that emotional juice, that connection. And uh, I was focusing exclusively you know, in the last two years of coaching people in their corporate jobs to leave their, leave their job and, and create a business they love. Now, uh, this is going to be really tough love and I'm sure I'm going to turn off some people listening right here right now, but, um, I just want to be honest and maybe this will even save them money spending with a coach. So, um, many of my students went on to, to make, you know, 50, 60, $70,000. I just had a recent student that, you know, he made back his investment with me in a, in a week or two. And by all means, I'm not trying to sell anybody on coaching. I actually don't want any coaching students. But I took on so many people. And the problem was I was trying to change people. I was trying to change employees into entrepreneurs. Or I was trying to change failing entrepreneurs into winning entrepreneurs. And it's definitely possible. But the problem is from a coach, I can't, like, I can only show you the door unless you're willing to step in it and through it and take ownership for walking through it, you're not going to win. And, um, I, it pains me to see struggling entrepreneurs paying money for coaches or consultants or whatever, and not getting the results and then blaming the coach. And quite often it is the coach is just shit and they're just taking your money, but truthfully it's got to come from you. And, uh, it's got to come from execution. It's got to come from your why nobody's going to be able to change that for you and no technique or trick or hack or secret weapon is not, it's executing the basics really well. And then it's 80% mindset. And I know it sounds so cliche, but it's true. So I kept running into the wall. Like I really wanted to serve people. I had a, a system that worked really well, but financially it was hard for me to scale. And I was so emotionally invested in my clients that it, it really burnt me out if I'm honest. Um, you know, to make a hundred grand a year coaching and the prices I was charging were way, like just way too low. I was charging like a thousand to $1,500 and I was helping people go basically go from, uh, no business to launch business and then pay me back within the first week or two. Um, that was kind of my intention and, and it worked beautifully, but I realized that working with winners and helping winners win more 
is far easier and it actually creates more impact. And there's some real, there's some real depth to that statement. So I just really want to say it again. Like no matter what, like everybody knows the 80, 20 rule, right? So there's going to be 80% of people that are just never going to win. And there's gonna be 20% of people that are going to win. Stop trying to change the 80% into 20% and just focus on those 20% people. It hurts a lot. I know there's a lot of people that are like, oh, but I want to save the 80%. I was there. Trust me. But there, there's no money in it. There, the success rate is super low because no matter what, something's going to come up where they might self-sabotage. But by focusing on the 20% of people that are going to win anyways and helping them just win more, man, it's super easy to have conversations with. Uh, they get it. And they also don't need you. This is the beauty. Like, they're in charge of their own destiny already. So they're working with you because they want to work with you, not because they need you. You know, it's like when people, people are, are starting a, even an interview series, like we're talking here because you've already started and because you've already had interviews and you're putting yourself out there. Of course, I'm super glad to come on and talk because you're, you would have won with or without me. Like it's, you're already moving, but for me to go and try to explain to somebody that's never filmed a video to go and start an interview series and then coach them through it. And they may never film that video. And it's not because I didn't coach them, right? It's because they didn't take the action. So this was the biggest shift in me mentality from helping like, like a DIY person, which is great. That's what a course is. And moving to a done for you model where the entrepreneur is just looking for the result and they need somebody they can trust to just get it done. And it's very clean. It's a very easy business as long as you're good at what you do. And yes, the barrier of entry is, har is harder, but because the barrier of entry is harder, there's less competition. And these, these business owners that have good money, they're not sitting there learning a course. Like they just, if they want to develop an app, they're not going to sit there and learn a course on developing an app. And then no, they're just going to pay somebody to get it done. And that's where the shift in December happened to me where I realized, look, let me just go done for you. Let me help people that are already winning win more. And I'm going to be able to create larger impact because if they win more, their customers get served more. And I'm, I'm only picking markets or businesses that I personally would sell or I personally endorse. So, you know, right now I've got a customer that is, he's a type one diabetic uh, and he's helping people uh, beat diabetes and, uh, and, get rid of medication and the rest of it. It really comes down to sugar addiction. So he's helping people overcome sugar addiction. Um, I'm helping people right now with uh, helping people save taxes and understanding their per proper write-offs and then investment strategy. So these are fun businesses where if, if I help them succeed, think of the impact. So that was the big shift in December. Uh, I'm right now exclusively focusing on video SEO because I have amazing results on the, on YouTube I'm getting a lot of traffic. And more importantly, I think that video marketing is so important, but there's a lot of misinformation in the space because there's a lot of courses teaching and these entrepreneurs won't do the courses because they're too busy. So let me help them just do the thing, help them plan a content map and then help them rank and upload the videos. And by them dominating the market, it becomes a flood of traffic coming in and they own the asset, which is the video. Um, Facebook ads are great, but you really have to be managing those ads in order to get success. And, and it wasn't, I didn't want to be tied to my computer all day. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. That's kind of my mental progression to where I am now. Um, and the beauty is, is that these, everybody needs video to move forward. So it, there's, there's just so much opportunity there. Um, but again, focusing on a done for you model instead of just teaching. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, we talked a little bit about your past and you, yeah. uh, you got us caught up to, to what you're doing in the present. But yeah. um, I want to I want to talk about the future for D1. Sure, where do you, absolutely. Where do you see yourself going and what would be kind of your your you know your biggest focus moving forward? Sure, so it's twofold. Um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't look after themselves and they're very like you know everybody else serving everybody else. So I am taking a little bit more time for myself now and uh, Making sure that whatever I develop serves me now, and I know that's a bit counterintuitive, and we talked about, oh, serving us, but the, the service mentality of serving you first, like it's, it's already ingrained in my brain, but really asking myself the question, what does my ideal life look like? Who do I wanna serve? Um, I kinda have this beer test, like would I have a beer with my client? 
And if the answer is no, then they're not for me. Um, yes, I'm in a position where I can be a little bit more selective, but that selective process actually makes you more valuable. Because by you saying no, people realize that no, like he's got boundaries and he does a certain thing and it actually increases your perceived value. Um, right now, my biggest goal, just from a personal standpoint and business standpoint, um, I definitely want to be getting back into music. So I've got this vision of uh, one show a month where I'm actually going out outside of Vancouver. So whether it's locally or internationally, me actually playing. And in the same uh, city, also giving a talk uh, just about general entrepreneurship. Whether it's paid or not, it really doesn't matter. But I've got this that, that allows me to travel, allows me to do music, allows me to share my message. Um, and my goal for this year is to get to 20 clients. Um, and if I can get that wheelhouse of 20 clients underneath my belt, financially, I don't know if that's going to be at the $5,000 mark. Um, I do have a minimum. Um, but if I can get 20 clients, then I've got kind of that core family of, again, entrepreneurs that I want to have a beer with and, and also to become my network. And then as either people drop off or as I continue to raise my prices, I can just replace those people. So let's say I close 20 people at 2000, that's 40 K a month. Uh, and then maybe the next person I sell, well, my minimum is now 3000 or 4,000 minimum. And it'll allow me to eventually organically grow that, that business, that million dollar mark fairly straightforward without me having to go out and sell aggressively. Now, the beauty is getting back to that grass statement, as I add value in their businesses at the $2,000 a month mark, it's very easy for me to say, well, hey, it worked at $2,000, let's do $4,000. So not only am I able to up, upsell them to that level, but there'll, there'll never be a, a run out of kind of income coming in. So I'm already working with quite a few clients. It's been great. Um, but I'm also not in a rush of growing it too quickly. I want to make sure that the relationships that I have are great and strong. So that when I move to the next one, I can create another strong relationship. Um, I don't want to be caught doing sales uh, by the end of next year or by the end of this year. And this gets back to the comment of one-time sales because once you fulfill the project, shit, you got to go find a completely new client. And, um, and this is the problem with the course model. You sell the course once and then what? Um, whereas, yeah, if I get to 20 clients, it's very easy for me to scale. So that's my vision by the end of the year, 20 clients. Um, well on the way to doing that already. And, uh, and then I just want to give my content away for free on YouTube. I think too many people have a hidden, hidden agenda on, on YouTube and it's fine. That's just their business model. Um, I've created a business model where I don't have to sell my information, which is exactly what I want. And, um, I think this, the authenticity and transparency needs to be heard. I think that's why Gary Vee is really relatable to a lot of people. Uh, he's also in an agency model. This again, gets back to modeling people that are successful in the industry. The reason why Gary's able to give away all this content for free is because he doesn't make his money from his information. He gets he makes his money from execution, which is where I want to be. Um, so I am, it's funny, you caught me at a good time. I'm probably about a week away from putting out five days a week worth of content now that things have settled. And I just want to inspire entrepreneurs to get out there and, and take action and get shit done. But I also don't want it to be gumdrops and rainbows. Uh, this shit's hard work and it, like, it, it sucks. And, uh, I want to make sure that as people are going down their journey, that they get to hear what they need to hear, not necessarily what they want to hear. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, to kind of lighten the mood, lighten the yeah. mood a little bit, <laughs> um, I got a few few fun questions for you. Hey, sure, shoot. So, if you could have, you mentioned you were a car guy earlier. Yeah. If you could have your dream car, okay. what would that car be? Interesting. Okay, so my previous dream car I own now, which was a uh, twin turbo Supra. Um, God, dream car now. Aventador Roadster, maybe? Lamborghini Aventador Roadster. They're hot, man. There's so many of them rolling around in the city, and they just, they're just noisy and obnoxious. They're, yeah, I would say an Aventador Roadster. Awesome. Something that I can drive every day and enjoy it, yeah. Okay. Um, you, say, you mentioned that you want to go around and play music. Um, yeah. What do you What do you play? Uh, electronic music, so house and drum and bass. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, if you If you could create your own movie, and I know you can, but if you were If you could just think it and it would happen, what would be the the main plot? Oh man. God, if I could just plunk myself into Iron Man, I think that would be <laughs> that would be awesome. You know, that's one. It's funny you say that. Um, it's actually an exercise that I just went through recently, and it was, uh, 
you know, I'm very into the perfect day, but uh, I actually don't personally dream enough in the future. And that's something that I'm working on right now. And uh, yeah, playing out that movie. I've got this itch for like robots or something like really tangible in tech. I don't know what it looks like yet, but yeah, I don't know. My, my answer would be just plunk me into Iron Man, maybe with a little bit less missiles and like bleeding and stuff. But uh, yeah, I would, yeah, I think it would be that. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So if you could go back to one time period, yeah, any time in history, which time period would that be? And why would you go back there? Huh. Oh, that's a good question. Where would I want to be? I think the telephone would be an interesting one. That first time of picking up that telephone and knowing that it worked and, and just all of a sudden realizing that we don't have to be face to face to connect at that level. I don't, I think, I mean, I know we're so jaded now with computers, but can you imagine just that moment of being able to connect with somebody from basically anywhere in the world. Yeah, I think that would be the moment. Okay. Uh, if you could go back in time and talk to one person, who would that be and what would you talk about? Holy, that is a deep question. I don't know. Martin Luther King, maybe? And about creating, I don't know, the courage to create a movement, I think, would be the conversation and just wanting to, yeah, I think that would be it. Like, just not even influence, but like the courage to create such influence. That's awesome. Um, if you could be one animal besides a human being, what type of animal would you be and why? Uh, wow. Maybe like an eagle or something or some sort of crazy flying animal. Just the freedom. Very cool. Very cool. So, uh, I just have uh, two more questions for you. Yeah, sure. I uh, really appreciate your time, Dewan. I've, I've had a blast. I hope you've had fun too. Yeah, it was fun. Um, first question for you is, what is your life's purpose? Uh, interesting. So, without going super woo-woo, um, and I also want to say that your purpose can change and I want people to know that because mine's definitely change and, and you just know what you know. I see my, um, I see myself as like this radio station. I don't know how to explain it. And again, I'm, you know, like the, these, this, this amplifier radio station and I just want to get really good messages on this radio station and share it, I think, and, and, and amplify it. And I think that's why I'm drawn to where I am right now. There's so much negative news and negative media and and scarcity and fear and I I just I'm so drawn to finding just amazing messages and solutions and I feel it's like like my obligation or like my my purpose to just amplify them. I I don't know what it looks like long term, but I just truly believe like that is my purpose to just help amplify really good messages. That's awesome. That's really cool, man. And uh, the last question I have for you is is there anything about yourself that you think is an important part of who you are that I did not ask you about today? In other words, just, what did I miss? Um, don't beat yourself up too much. And um, yeah, it, like Rome is not built in a day, in a month, in a year, I, I think, uh, and, and I know like the question you're asking, like, what did you miss? But, um, yeah, just perseverance and, and you don't have to know the outcome to be successful. You just have to know the direction. I think, I think is, if I could just say one thing, like, you know, the, the, the fluff stuff of saying, Hey, you know, software company, record label, publishing company, agency, it sounds all great. But truthfully, it was just moving in a direction and not necessarily knowing what where the outcome was and being honest about it. Like, you know, some people have a 10 year vision to the day. That's cool. But life does not happen that way. It just doesn't. Um, so I would just say the perseverance. If there's one thing I could I could leave uh, to recap it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, again, yeah. Dewan, thank you so much for uh, for jumping on the show today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's been been an absolute blast, and, and uh, you know, I think we provided a ton of value. 
I want to yeah. thank you for being so transparent and open and sharing so much. Uh, it really does mean a lot. And yeah. to, uh, to everybody that's listening, thank you. I love y'all. Y'all the reason that we're doing this. And, uh, you know, if, if we can only impact you in, in a positive way, um, that that's enough. That, that is enough for me. So, again, thank you, D1. Thank you. This has been another Project Egg interview. Today we've been talking with D1 Bainey from Canada. All right, everybody. Let's build a better world together. Bye.